I've been to three or four competitions this year. <laughs> well, it started with one in the worst golf with the same different trophies. And the most common thing that worst golf gets is usually a tennis racket in the videotape on how to play <laughs> Thank you, Ed, very much. You know, it does my heart good to meet again with all the folks that I've worked with in the past years and all the model builders that, that uh, I've flown with in earlier times. It's just so good to see you all, I don't know what to do. I want to thank the people that brought pictures, especially those that identified the pictures, because my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. You know, I first came to NASA in 19, 1940. I joined uh, the organization and I was put on the propeller construction shop as an under-aircraft model maker. Tom Hulsher was my first supervisor there. Tom is an unusual person. I gotta get this up where I can read it. Okay. Tom is a native Hamponian, having seen having been born and raised in LaSalle Avenue. Tom was always interested in model airplanes and built and flew many models. Hired by NASA at NACA, Tom so impressed the fires to be that they decided to hire model builders to construct wind tunnel propellers. Tom started the Hampton Roads Model Association, which later became the Virginia Model Association, which held many Virginia model contests from 1938 to 1942. One of Tom's top models was called the Hulcher Hurricane. Uh, I want to ask Tom sometime whatever happened to that Hulcher Hurricane. Does he still have it up in the attic? Tom quit NACA to form a company to manufacture a high-speed camera of his invention, one that was much sought after by the scientific community. My purpose this evening is to introduce a dedicated model builder, a talented inventor, and an all-around gracious person, one whose talents and abilities are exceptional. May I present Charles A. Hulcher, better known as Tom. Good thing y'all didn't wait any long, I'll put that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I'm going to have to read this, but first I want to thank Mr. Van Dover, the president of the Brain Busters. Is that better? <clears throat> and um, I'm happy to have an un uh, and all of the Brain Busters and their families. And I'm happy to speak on the saga of the model building American boy. Except they don't look like boys anymore. <laughs> I, I remember them all when they were 18, 20, and uh, they still look the same, but there's just something different. I'll get to that a little later. I'm going to read this, otherwise it would take too long, and uh, I'll just make a few comments. Tonight we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Brain Busters Model Airplane Club. As I think back 50 years ago, war clouds were looming all around the world. Hitler had already conquered several nations, smaller nations, and was bombing the hell out of, out of England. Every country through it, the world was arming to the teeth. The number of arms was, was fast and deadly. Um, the number one arms was the fast and deadly aircraft, bombers and fighters. It was evident that the nation which possessed the most effective air force would certainly win World War II. NACA was America's greatest hope for the research and development of the most effective air wars. NACA was Russian completion of better and faster wind tunnels. NACA obtained all of its personnel from the standard civil service register. A few years earlier, it had hired every American 
aeronautical engineer as they gra graduated from college and universities throughout our whole nation. NACA had to build propellers to drive these huge wind tunnels. These propellers were much bigger by far than any had, that it had previously been built, not only at Langley, but probably anywhere in the world. Since all of the <clears throat> propellers were to be made of laminated Sitka spruce, pattern making was the closest trade applicable to this project. When it was close to time for the high personnel for this project, um, NACA learned there was not one single pattern maker application on file with the Civil Service Commission. Every pattern maker was actively engaged in uh, already working in war related activities. I was working in the newly built spin tunnel with my boss Charlie Zimmerman, struggling to prevent aircraft from tailspins and killing people and destroying airplanes. In fact, this was the greatest cause of uh, disasters in the whole world. I had been employed as a lab attendant. Dr. Sharp, then administrative head at Langley, had watched me and other model builders flying rubber and gas-powered model airplanes, and he thought I would be helpful at the NACA. Laboratory attendants were persons who attend guinea pigs and, and rabbits, and although I'd never seen a guinea pig at that time, I got a good mark on my grade and got on, on as such. <clears throat> model building was flourishing at our local Hampton Roads Club. We organized other groups in Norfolk, Portsmouth, Lynchburg, Roanoke, all over the state, <clears throat> Alexandria, and numerous other places. We had, uh, had arranged to have all of these groups approved by the National Aeronautics Association. <coughs> We had numerous contests throughout the state with both rubber-powered and gasoline-powered models. Many thousands of visitors came to watch these contests, not only at Langley Field, but other places throughout the state. Even NACA engineers joined into building and flying model airplanes. Engineers such as Hewitt Phillips, Dick Lindsay, and others built and flew models. Large groups of other NACA engineers <coughs> handled the official <coughs> the officials' business of timing the models and measuring them and doing all the things involved in that. Dr. H. J. E. Reed, chief engineer at NACA, and Dr. Sharp often attended the statewide contest and awarded the trophies. You may have seen them on some of those old movies. All the NACA officials were fascinated watching the performance of these model makers. Some of them were young boys and girls around 15 or 16 years of age, while others were older men, much too old to chase models. Model clubs meetings usually featured aeronautical experts such as Eastman N. Jacobs, father of the NACA family of airfoils and head of the variable density wind tunnel. Dr. Rothrock from the engine laboratory and other experts in aircraft fuels and engines uh, spoke to the group at, at frequent meetings. They were all amazed at the knowledge these young folks exhibited. They knew all about lift, drag, stability, sweep back, dihedral auxiliary airfoils, and so forth. They also knew about small gas engines, how to wire the electrical ignition timers, and how to get the most out of a rubber band motor. <clears throat> Aside from all this, there is a mysterious and driving force in these special people. This driving force was to build model airplanes that take off from the ground, fly around for a while, sometimes a long time, and safely land, and to do all this better than some other member of the model building group. Looking backwards 50 years or more, it is now more than ever clearly evident that this group of young people's most useful, most useful asset was that they were thinking, all on their own. They didn't have any computers to try to think for them. <laughs> you can truly say they were brain busters. Dr. Sharp was still faced with the problem of building propellers for the wind tunnels. I believe he deserves full credit for seeing the possibility, remote as it may have been, of using model builders to build those, these propellers. 
For the first time in the history of the Civil Service Commission, he convinced them to set up a civil service job classification as model maker for any person who has successfully built and flown model airplanes and entered them into formal competition. <clears throat> as soon as this civil service announcement was made, NACA was flooded with applications. Most of them came from a lot of you guys. John, uh, old John Morgan was one of the first, and he told me that last night that he came in, I think he said it was August of 1939, and uh, um, Dr. Sharp himself escorted him down to the spin tunnel and introduced him to me, and he was one of the first of them. Cadwell Johnson, too, was one of the first of them. I was transferred from the spin tunnel in the research department to the technical service division where I was placed in charge of building these propellers. Now, you know, it don't seem possible that you could go from the little models you saw flying around in here and all the others and, and suddenly start building something so monstrous and big as the biggest propellers ever built by man with a bunch of kids. But that's exactly what happened. A large building was started in the West Area, the first building in this area. I was told that I would have no grown men, only these young boys, model makers, to work for me. The biggest break that I had was that one of these boys was, was Cabell Johnson, who had worked early and had worked with me some in the spin tunnel. A small amount of shop space was made available uh, in the NACA towing basin. Shop. Some of the first boys to arrive, like old Bill O'Dell, Dick Everett, John Brace, and many others I can't immediately recall, laid out templates for the blade laminations, and we developed a very special portable bandsaw because the blades were so big you couldn't move them in a the little shop, so we moved the saw instead. <laughs> Later, somebody else did that, and, and uh, we should have invented. We should have had it patented. <clears throat> When the prop shop was finished, we moved in with many of the templates already completed. NACA ordered a number of large machines that none of us and none of the boys had ever seen or heard of, like a large edge ripper, a 36-inch bandsaw, 36-inch sanders, 20-gallon glue mixing machines, a monstrous planer, and numerous other small tools. We built our own glue press with large two-inch bolts two-inch diameter bolts spaced about every foot along the 25-foot span to uh, glue these large blades together. We had big heavy ratchets, oh, probably this long, that they'd all have to pull in unison on each side together. And that there's a movie somewhere, I hope it's still in existence, of that operation, and someday maybe we can get get the NACA and ASA to find it for us, because that was an unbelievable sight. If you didn't get these propellers glued in, in 15 minutes, you had to throw them away, because the pressure wasn't on. Every one of them had to be scrubbed on both sides with hand scrubbed with brushes with glue and turned over and pillow blocks put in and then put the pressure on it. And by the time it was through, these boys had raised all manner of hell and hollered and carried on and got uh, glue all in each other's hair. It was really an operation. And one day, Dr. Victory was down with some lovely women, and uh, he was upset with the way they talked. And, and Ernest Johnson told me we had to cut that out and almost lost one of the big propellers that way. They couldn't do anything unless they did it their way. <laughs> <laughs> we developed and had built numerous small tools, such as a pneumatic spoke shave that could remove a tremendous amount of wood exactly the way you wanted it and shaped exactly the way the propellers had to be made. The Sitka spruce came from the west coast in carload lots, where it was stored in the full-scale wind tunnel, which happened to be close to the railroad track. All of this lumber was green and had to be stacked on runners to start the drying process. We built our own drying room with heaters and fans to circulate the air and to reduce the moisture content to exactly 15%. Instead of using the old conventional way of making templates, 
and carefully fitting them, putting a little blue in all of them, and cutting a little out. Uh, we got rid of all that, and we built it. We worked out a way to uh, cut the stations with a portable eight-inch circular saw that was guided by uh, a heavy template that cut it exactly to the right station fast. We had a phonograph needle we put in a in a round disc machined out so that we could scratch that line on the template and and then they make the template so it would follow exactly the contour. We had hundreds of suggestions from our enthusiastic and always thinking group of model builders. Every one of them knew how to do everything. And the damn near did. <laughs> and, um, we built the we built the lane that we built built the wind tunnel propellers for Langley Field and also Market Field on the west coast ahead of schedule. All woodworking machinery runs at a very high speed and is extremely dangerous. Many of the old time pattern makers who worked at the old model shop lacked one or two fingers here and there. We finished the entire propeller project with no serious accidents at all. The Sunday morning that power was first applied to the two 8,000 horsepower motors, uh, one propeller turning right hand and the other left hand, as required, my personal tension reached its maximum peak. When the wind started smoothly flowing as it was supposed to, I experienced a tremendous relaxing satis satisfaction. These propellers used in the 16-foot wind tunnels were approximately 45 feet in diameter and as I recall, weighed about 20 tons each. And that's a far cry from a little road-powered model. But if you think, you can do anything. These, 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 uh, they had 45 to 50 laminations of Sitka spruce with a three-quarter inch Sitka spruce, and they've been carefully finished and painted by the model builders themselves. They were also assembled in large steel hugs, hug, hubs with extremely precise steel liners. Precision bolts ran through the steel liners to fasten these blades to the hubs. The propellers themselves were accurate to within one hundredth of an inch and, had, and you couldn't measure that easily. You had to use a transit when you're working with 45 feet. You couldn't just find scales, you know, but the boys learned to do all of that without any problems, hardly at all. <clears throat> they also dynamically balanced them so that they would spin smoothly. I don't think Percy Kappa ever learned the difference between static and, and <laughs> dynamic gun. <laughs> Although he thought he did. Hundred, hundreds of model makers from every state in the Union had been employed and trained to successfully complete this most unbelievable project. I knew then, and I'm ever, even more confident of it today, that boys who have what it takes to build and fly model airplanes in competition with others were truly great thinkers. They could have done most any complex operation basically because they used their brain to think it through. I'm extremely proud and thankful for what these boys did and I cannot help but wonder <clears throat> where we might have been today if they had not been available and could not have done this job. And our aircraft had to do with their benefit of Langley, Langley's wind tunnels. As soon as NACA management realized that the propeller problem was being solved, they immediately started placing these boys just about every important job underway at the laboratory. This was later to lead into the starting of the NACA Apprentice Administration, but that's another long story. And I wish to thank you all, and have, hope you have a very happy 50th. I can see you already having it. Uh, for the for model builders. Now there's a few little things I was going to mention. You know, if I had been here before last night, I would have been able to do this better because I've seen so many guys that I remember now, and it just brings back a whole flood. I remember the night Poythus got married, Dave Poythus got married in the old Sims Eden Community Center. And look at it, it's still, it worked all the way through. And there he sits, happy as can be with his wife. 50 years ago. <laughs> and then, yeah. 
You know, it, it's interesting that, that Cadwell Johnson, he was one of the one of the best of all, and he, he he's, his, he's still living. I got a lovely letter from him in my pocket I just got a few minutes ago, um, saying he was sorry he couldn't be here, maybe somebody will read it for you. But uh, working with Max Fajay, uh, who was also a, a former model aircraft, model airplane builder, as a contractor, now he's designing space station for American. He designed all of the space uh, vehicles that have been built by the American uh, people. You all know, remember John Brace and Fritz. I'm not sure just what's happened. I heard John might be having a, a brain tumor, which is understandable. Knowing John, <laughs> he had to have everything. <laughs> Bert, Bert and Frank Dyson, I'm sure you remember them. I picked that Bert for my sister Marie here, and they lived a happy life of, what was it, 45 years? Poor old Bert left us, and then a short time later, Frank also passed away. But they were both, Bert stayed at NASA, and he was ended up, he could compete, draw swords with people like Becker or any other aeronautical engineer that was out there. Leonard Purdy and his brother, I don't know who's going to be here, but it's easy to tell who he is. He still looks the same. He's a kid, and he'll always be. They worked at large aircraft companies in Georgia and later went on to run a model airplane manufacturing business and later sold that, and now he's doing anything he wants to. And you'll notice he's still flying model airplanes. And so is Cadwell Johnson. Bill O'Dell, he returned to Pound, Virginia. You all remember him. He, he got to be an undertaker, and he's proud of it. He's the last man to let you down, and he's, he, was, he was a friendly, friendly undertaker, and he, uh, he he built up a big streamlined business, as he called it, in Pound, Virginia, and, and later sold it for a real great profit, and now he's still building model airplanes and raising little small horses that are both the size of dogs. And Joe Boyle, you all all know him, he's done, he's done remarkably well, Frank Palmetto, I got to see him again after all these years. He's done well. All of them, Dick Everett, although he's gone now, he, he did real well, except for a few things that messed up his marriage, but <laughs> so just allow you all know that. Charlie Nagel, Charlie Nagel, uh, I think he's still living, and it's, I understand he's, he performed a lot of unusual jobs for us. I remember we gave him a a uh, four-legged stool to cut a little bit off, and he cut it all the way down to, to the seat before he ever got it level. <laughs> <laughs> but don't believe he couldn't do other things. He did, he did, they all did. Joe Dodson, Paul Joe's gone. He did a lot of engineering work for NASA. And Harry Schoff, he's deceased now, and he went to went down to Houston with Dr. Gilruth's group. I don't know if you remember Walter Lane, Walter Lane was our head, the layered man. He uh, he could t really lay out templates and lay out the uh, things that we had to make the propellers with. And I just saw in the paper about a month ago that he had died up in uh, his home uh, in New England somewhere. Harold Maxwell, you remember Harold? He came, John, uh, Johnny Morgan went back and got him and Shelfont and brought them down. And, and Harold, uh, Harold went on to uh, end up uh, he was real studious. He ended up in charge of the entire West Area Engineering Group prior to his retirement. And John, John is still here, and he's just the same old John. He came to work from Clarksburg, West Virginia, on August the 7th, 1939. He was one of the first model makers hired under the civil service. Dr. Sharp personally brought him down to my shop in the spin tunnel to introduce him. John did pretty good himself, heading up the entire model work for the Langley Laboratory before retiring. He took he took Kappa's job, and I'm proud of him for it. Uh, my brother Raymond Holcher, he's deceased now. He retired for health reasons, but he uh, he ended up as assistant head of the instrument division, working for my old friend Stumpy Howard. You may remember, he's still going strong at 91. Hewitt Phillips, of course, is a real unbelievable one. He came to NASA as a specially gifted research engineer from MIT, but he was also a model builder right from scratch. 
and worked with all the model clubs and brain brushes and is still building models. I always remember the first gas model he made was, had, was a little tiny engine and he made the gas tank to make it lighter out of paper. You can see he's still doing that with this big <laughs> lighter over here. And he, that damn thing worked, you know. He, he, he doped it, sealed it up. I don't know whether he, I don't know whether he used a straw or how he got gas to the engine, but it, it worked. And uh, just to give you some idea of how well he's done, I don't know what he would have done if he'd just been an MIT engineer. There have been a lot of them. But he was a model builder, too, and he's the only one I know that is still, is still has a room of office available at NASA. He can go there anytime he wants, and he can use anything he wants. I think even the 16-foot wind tunnel if he needs to. And that's a pretty high way to get up there. You can't do any better than that. I deeply appreciate being asked to do this. Although it drove me crazy to find the time to do it, I'm still working every day. Uh, but uh, I appreciate it, and uh, I hope you have a very, very happy time. Thank you very much. We're not, we're, we're not done with Tom yet. Uh, I'd like Ed to present this plaque to Tom from all of the Brain Busters, past, present, and future. Well, this is the highest honor I ever received. <laughs> uh, the plaque says, presented to Tom Hulcher from the Brain Busters, 50th anniversary, 1942 to 1992. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't think there's a model builder in the world that doesn't know Frank Zayek. And Frank sent a letter to us that he couldn't make it, but he did tell us that he wanted to present some books to Tom Hulcher. He said, please extend my congratulations to the club for uh, being so persistent to stay in existence. And as a favor, please give the enclosed books to Tom. They may give him an idea what happened to me after he and, and Lai left the area. And this is from Frank Zayek well, to Tom Hulcher. I really appreciate that. I looked all over hell for my old books that he made. <laughs> Just, you know, and they folded up and I couldn't find them. And I appreciate this very much. It's real nice. Thank you. One so of those is a brand new This is a new one. Yeah, I understand. That's the people who are standing in line to buy that one. Well, good. That's wonderful. Well, thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Sam. since the Brain Busters have been in existence for 50 years, uh, there's, there's not that many clubs uh, in AMA uh, that have lasted that long. A lot of them have fallen by the wayside. There are still a few. Uh, the Minnesota group is having their 50th anniversary this year. Uh, there's other groups that have ha are in existence 52, 53 years. Uh, to recognize this, we've asked Howard Crispin to come up and say a few words about this club and, and to talk to you uh, about how we do and what goes on. Howard Crispin, our district uh, vice president. As, as uh, Pam said, there are a lot of clubs that have made 50 years uh, probably around, but not clubs that have been in continuous existence that long. I, I guess the first one that we got involved with and John was involved, Worth was involved with, it was the Chicago Aeronauts. They, I guess they were the first to hit 50 years and that was six years ago. So there, there are a few, uh, yeah, but they were, they, they were kind of a, a different and unusual group anyway because they, they had a close relationship with the city of Chicago and doing a lot of things which helped put them together and held them together. Uh, there are a few others, the, the club in New York that's uh, I think to get ready for their 50th also. But they, the Brain Busters, though, is unique among the clubs because of their contributions, not just to aero modeling, but to full-scale aviation, too. They all, they all work together with this group. And it was something that I think probably bound them together stronger 
than any other club you had in the country. There was a lot more to it because it was that all that personal relationship day to day along with the A-Row modeling and it made a difference. Uh, and through the years, the Brain Busters have also been involved with a lot of community activities and so on. They're well known in the area for the service and other things. And we do need to recognize them for the continuous service that they've given to Aero Modeling. And tonight, I would like to present them with the Award of Excellence for AMA Clubs. And if the club president would come up here, I would be happy to present that. And this says it's a from the Academy of Model Aeronautics, a division of the National Aeronautic Association, an aeromodeling representative in the United States of the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, AMA Club Award of Excellence, the Brain Busters, in grateful recognition of 50 years of devotion to aeromodeling. Shut up, I don't take care of it. <laughs> uh, I, I can't uh, leave the podium without telling you a story. I was told don't tell this story. Uh, as you know, we have a treasurer. He's our treasurer for life. Uh, almost every, every person sitting in this room has been a brain buster president, vice president, secretary. I don't think there's ever been another treasurer. And I'm talking about Reed Hall. Uh, Reed Hall is a great guy. I'd like to I'd like to honor him tonight because he's been our treasurer for I can't say how many years, probably 30, 40 years. But uh, some people say I pick on him. I don't really. But one day uh, Reed and I were going to a contest up in Manassas, Virginia, and we we're going up Route 95, and all of a sudden it started getting a little bit foggy. And as we're driving along, I was driving, Reed was the co-pilot, and Reed said, uh, Van, uh, this, this stuff out here, he says, how is this stuff out here like an Italian with two wives? And I said, Reed, what are you talking about? I couldn't understand him. He says, well, it, it, the thing is, it's a big a mist. <laughs> and this is some of the humor. I, uh, <laughs> that Reed comes up with. So I, I would like to honor Reed as our treasurer. I'd like everybody to give him a big hand because he's a great guy. <laughs> I also neglected, we have Jeff Stiles here who is an AMA representative. He's our PR man, does a pretty outstanding job. And I'd like to welcome him here and hope you don't feel that I did slight you. Um, I, I would like to uh, say that we have a lot of memorabilia around the area, and after we finish with this uh, get-together here, you're more than welcome to, to look around. We, we have some things over here that if you'd like to buy some, we have T-shirts, we have patches, we have stick-ons, and uh, what I would like is we have a uh, numerous amount of pictures back there with, with all you guys in there, some of you quite y younger, uh, Bob Stewart with hair, uh, so some things like that, and I, I've left some stick-ons in there, and if you recognize a person in the pictures, go ahead and write the guy's name on the stick-on and, and paste it right on top of the picture, would you please? Right over the face. Thank you. So without any further ado, I, I'd like to turn it over to Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan's got some administrative announcements and some stuff to tell you about what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Again, I, I welcome every one of you and I'm, I'm sure glad that the Brain Busters got back together again. Thank you. Uh, administration stuff or information of interest to you. Uh, first of all, tomorrow morning from about 10 until 12, we're going to have uh, RC uh, flying well, RC Electric, is that right, Woody? Uh, yeah, RC Electric demonstration. Now, the place it's going to be is out at the uh, Air Force Gunbutt site. And uh, trying to think the best way to tell you that to get there for those of you who want to go. 
if you have your map, you'll see it on the map it says Durand Road. It's a fork in the road where Langley Boulevard and Durand Road come together down by the, uh, the shop area. If you follow Durand Road, you will come to the Air Force uh, gate, to the guardhouse. You go past that, and when you'll come to a fork in the road. Turn west at that fork in the road, go down past the golf course, and the gun butts are on the left. And uh, you chose that site that is the uh, Air Force's place where they're permitting people to fly uh, radio control. And it seems like uh, Woody mentioned this and uh, pursues Mac. It's the best place to, to fly with and make sure we don't get interference from other flyers on the radio control frequency. Okay, the, many of you, most of you, have paid me uh, to buy tickets for the Air and Space uh, Center in downtown Hampton. The tickets have been paid for at the Air and Space Center, and uh, what you will have to do is go down there and present your yellow badges with say Brainbusters 50th reunion at the ticket uh, desk. They have a list of your names. They will check the names against the list that I gave them yesterday, which was everybody that had registered uh, prior to yesterday morning. And they should give, issue you a ticket because the tickets have been paid for. Huh? I wrote them a check, and uh, until Reed gets the money back to me, I'm in the hole for a substantial amount. So if there's, if they don't have the tickets, uh, I'm going to be pretty upset. Uh, all right, my agreement with the uh, Space Center is that we will not be there as a group. Uh, they didn't particularly want to have 60 people descend on them at once. And I thought that you people would much prefer to go there at your leisure and do what you want to do during the rest of the day. So whenever you get there during their business hours, uh, they should have the ticket for you. Now there is one thing. They have an IMAX film there, which uh, is not on the ticket I purchased for you. If you want to see the IMAX film, you will have to pay an extra charge. I don't know, I think it's like two or three dollars. The three dollar cost to see the IMAX film. The tickets you have will get, will permit you to walk through all the exhibits and uh, admire the old airplanes down there and whatever else they have. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting in there. Van and you and some of the others have seen it. Joe the down there. Uh, I haven't seen it and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the tomorrow evening, we've uh, arranged to have a Dutch Street dinner at the Fisherman's Wharf in downtown Hampton. It's on Ivy, at the end of Ivy Home Road. Uh, Ivy Home runs into Kickasan Road down in Hampton. Uh, your map shows where the two come together, so you should be able to find it. You're going to go through a residential area and wonder if you're lost. Uh, just keep going because eventually the road gets down to the waterfront and the fisherman's wharf is right at the waterfront and the road ends in their parking lot. So just uh, stay the course and you'll get there. Uh, dinner is at 6 o'clock and they have the table reserved for us or room reserved for us. And uh, when you get there, I don't know if there will be a line or not, whatever, go to the head of the stairs.